play. This episode is brought to you by Engro Games, the makers of Reach and Okazaki, two micro games, 18 cards each, that are on Kickstarter right now. Reach is a two player cooperative game, and Okazaki is a one to two player trick taking game. If you order the Kickstarter, they come in a limited edition package, and they ship anywhere in the world. It's already been funded, so right now they're looking at some stretch goals. Click on the link below for more information. And now let's go to the show. Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 69. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Matt. Hello, how's it going? Good, and we are doing the PAX East 2020 podcast. Another PAX has happened. It's it has, the PAX pod. It's, it's, it's come into Boston. We went, we played many, many games, and uh, it's become kind of a tradition for us. I, I remember just now that PAX East was the subject of our very first episode. Yeah, PAX has become quite routine for us. Uh, now we also go to Unplugged, so that's two PAXs every year. Yeah, I, I sometimes wonder going into it whether I really want to do another big con like that, and I almost always come away glad I went. Yeah, I mean, for me, PAX East, when it was initially... My, my first PAX East, even before we started the podcast, I was more into video games and more into Penny Arcade itself, and now yeah. that I've, I've grown a bit weary of the video games in a con setting because I'm just so behind on video games. I play old ones mostly. I'm, I, I've always been like five years behind in video games anyways because yeah. I, I don't like paying full price. And now it's just PAX East is the con where I go and try to play all the 2019 games that I didn't play yet. Yeah, or the, yeah, or the year right. before, rather. This year would be 2019. Yeah, as far as board games. Yeah, um, as far as the video games go, I mean, it is cool to see all these hundreds of vendors kind of pick up trends. I mean, the trend that I like on the video game side is just VR. Like, I, I currently don't own a VR system. So, like, a big con like this is really the only time I'm going to see what's happening and so since that's like a you know somewhat cutting edge that's a really cool thing on the video games but but really yeah the fun thing is playing all the games we haven't played <laughs> yeah did you try did you try out any vr this year yeah this year i didn't actually play any although i think it was probably easier to play this year than any year because there's so many like they have the vr free play area that that's seems to be run real well but then just a ton of smaller vendors have a vr headset demoing their game yeah uh, and it, and i watched other people play their vr and and saw some really cool stuff i didn't actually participate this year yeah i've i did vr once at pax and it was enjoyable but it was the game wasn't very good so i don't know if i got the full vr experience especially since i was watching the a preview of half-life alex uh, earlier oh today and that game looks incredible, and I'm gonna I'm gonna see if if Amber wants to get a VR machine at some point. As I look over at her on the couch, <laughs> oh, she's nodding her head. Yes, all right. Ooh, I think she's interested as well. So we'll we'll, it, if, we'll see. If I'm, if I'm not allowed to borrow it from you, I'll rent it from you for a month. <laughs> no, no, you'll be able to come over and play and borrow it. Yeah, so uh, PAX was pretty routine by this point, nothing new. There's a whole bunch of 2D side-scrolling platformer games coming out, as always. And uh, I don't know, I just, every year the, the time I spend in, among the video games shrinks and shrinks. I think it was like an hour this year. Yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. like, I've seen them all, it's it's fine. There's, a, there's isometric adventure role-playing games and two-player, 2D platformers, and that's like 80% of it. It seems. Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, the other thing that catches your eye are the huge booths of, what, Quad A Studios or Triple A Studios, however big they are. Um, yeah, so like, the, the Nintendo Animal Crossing one was neat. Yeah, that that looked awesome. It looked like you could go and... I don't play Animal Crossing, but it looked like you could have a nice day on the farm right there in the middle of thousands and thousands of people. I, I have no interest in Animal Crossing, so... <laughs> It was a cool uh, production, but yeah, there was the magic one where they—I—I I don't even know what that is. Some kind of massive online game. 
Um, that's it's, was it online? It looked like it's just a normal isometric role playing game. Maybe that's right. I don't know. I don't yeah. think it I was mean, an MMO. The gameplay didn't look amazing, but it just uh, again the production of a huge booth. There was the like music game that had a massive alien looking DJ. Oh yeah, I forgot. That was the coolest booth, and it was interesting because it was essentially it was Drop Mix, but entirely digital. After I think Drop Mix kind of failed. Because I, oh, yeah. you, you can get it really cheap now, so I think it didn't sell as well as they anticipated. So now they're just kind of, kind of, okay, yeah. I mean, insofar as it was physical components, but it was like cards, but they had little RFID chips in them, I think, and the machine would detect which ones they were. So in the original one, you re- you literally play cards, and now you're just pushing a button on a screen. So I suppose it's more accessible and easier to sell, and the the cost for them obviously is lower it, it seemed like a fun toy but i was never interested enough to buy it yeah so i guess all that all this to say i still enjoy spectacle and i get my fix at pax as far as that goes but <laughs> yeah yeah I, mean, I think what two, an hour or two was yes yeah. was, was it on on the floor we spent more time playing magic in our two headed giant mystery booer, booster sealed event <laughs> yes. which was I was skeptical going in of Two Headed Giant, but it was fun. So I think you didn't realize, and and this is what intrigues me about Two Headed Giant. You're actually building two decks from a single pool, and that's kind of uh, I don't know. That's an interesting deck construction constraint. I don't know if I would I would do it I would do it again if there weren't better options, but I think just a normal draft is more fun. Oh, draft it will blow sealed out of the water anytime. I mean, and it just took longer to play because yeah. you gotta you kind of like run things by your partner every time, except for a couple of our opponents where one person was clearly just dictating the entire game, which was a bit awkward. I think we had more fun in that regard. Like it was a good time. It was it was casual enough that um, yeah, it was just a fun time. I don't know. I was yeah. I ended up with an aggro red black deck. Matt, that's not what aggro means. That was definitely tempo. Oh, whatever. It was not aggro. Okay, as far as limited goes, I don't know. You had a bunch of five drops. (laughs) I did not have a bunch of five drops. You had some five drops. It's not aggro. My curve was super low. I ended up with, like, the deck that I'm most biased against in normal situations. (laughs) And you had this sweet blue-white control deck. So it was really fun to play together. We had to work together because... Our decks had like such different parts of our overall strategy, which was ultimately really bad. We went one and three or something like that. <laughs> well, I mean, as I suspected when we were building, I think we just got bad cards. Yeah, it was just unlucky. I, I don't know if I don't think any I don't think there were decks in there that we didn't see that were significantly better than we made. OK, I want to grind an axe that I have been thinking about. You've been holding uh, on to this axe for a while, and now you're ready yeah, to grind? Yeah, and not that I haven't grounded on other occasions, but... So, this whole mystery booster thing that has been going on for the last six months or so in Magic, there are like 1,500 cards you could open up. It's just a huge pool of cards that could go into these boosters. All right, so that, that's what that's what it is. The thing that's so great about Draft, in my opinion, is you have a pool that you can understand and there are themes and different uh, synergies that run through the pool itself all the possible cards and you just don't get that with this booster draft it's cool that you can get all these powerful old cards in the booster draft but it's not i think what really makes draft great so with that said i think that this two-headed giant was probably my favorite possible way to play these mystery booster drafts because it's just a little bit silly. You're doing a teamwork thing. You don't mind that there are so many unrelated cards. I don't know. That, that's just the that's just the thought. I think that's just you, Matt. I think I just see it as a different thing than a normal. Yeah, it's just I, you replace you replace this kind of like more intense meta understanding with just craziness, and that's a lot of fun to me. <laughs> yeah, I know. But if I'm gonna do that, then I want to, you know. Two-headed giant sealed sounds perfect. Anyways, that was our magic experience. I did do another draft on Sunday when I was alone and everyone had left me. And uh, I got stomped in round one. 
the sky built an incredible deck. It was this was Theros, the new standard set. No, it was with Mystery. Oh, okay, okay. And he built this incredible is it deck that just did is it things, and it was it just destroyed me. It was so much better. Mine was my typical. Here's some good cards. I went three colors. I didn't get mana screwed at all, but man, his deck was literally all burn and counter spells and all cards that boost off of instance. <laughs> wow. It was it was so good. <laughs> Anyways, let's go back over to some regular board games. The first one that we played was oh, right. Parks, a yeah. a little worker placementy kind of game about traveling to national parks. It's one of these games now where it's becoming a thing where it's a perfectly good game, but if it didn't have the art direction and component and production that it has, it would be relatively unmemorable. But the art and production of this game is top of the line. Yeah, you brought up the, the comparison to Wingspan, and I think that kind of hits the nail on the head. It's just a beautiful game. And, I mean, for me, I love national parks. Like, my, my wife and I kind of have a bucket list that we we want to go to all the national parks. So I, I just was eating up the artwork. Oh, um, it is it is so good. And it was fun. Um, I, I, it was a fine game, I would say. Uh, but it kind of it, it ended up being a package that, like, I would definitely bring that out when my parents come. <laughs> it's a good enough game that I will enjoy it, but it has the production and theme that I could, you know, bring my parents into something a little heavier than they would normally do. You know, it, it just it's not a gamer's game. Well, no, it, it's it's not heavy, but it certainly is a Euro game that does all the worker placement to get resources, cash them in for stuff. Yeah. Kind of game. It's just absent the production. It's a pretty pedestrian, normal type of that game that doesn't do much particularly exciting one way or the other with things. So, so I, I think there were a couple interesting things about Parks, but I don't think there were ever really hard decisions. Or, or, or the decisions that were hard were between kind of one or two short-term things. Yeah, I think that might be partially a consequence of us playing two-player. Okay. Because the board doesn't get less... Like, you, you add, like, one more tile in for three to four players. Yeah. Like, one more worker placement space, and you have two workers each. So if you're playing four players, that thing's going to get crowded really fast. And you only yes. have... It's like Viticulture. You only have one use each round of going on someone else's space. So I think four player may be the more cutthroat version of the of that game. It might make it a bit more fun. But I, the exciting thing to me is that, like Wingspan, I think it did fairly well on its Kickstarter, I think it was a Kickstarter game. And those games are just obliterating the notion that people only want fantasy and sci-fi. And yeah. I love fantasy and sci-fi, but like these natural nature games, I guess, naturalistic games that are highlighting other aspects of life instead of, you know, 15th century farmers and fantasy elves and sci-fi ships can sell a lot. And that's a very, very positive direction for the hobby. Total agreement here. The next game we played was a relatively new one, one from last year from Bruna Katala, I think, uh, Ishtar Gardens of Babylon. And this was introduced to us by some friends who were visiting from Pittsburgh who came and stayed and went to PAX East with us, and they were fantastic. Good friends, and we played many, many games with them. Uh, this is one they had played before, and then they played it while we were finishing up Parks and then passed it over to have us uh, give it a try because they really liked it. And it's a pretty much an abstract game, tile lane game, where you're drafting the tiles and you're trying to... The cool thing is that you're trying... You have this player board and these kind of five upgrade paths as you gather gems from the board by laying tiles on top of them. And then you can spend those gems for various things, but this upgrade path was was really neat, and it, it very much dictated a couple of different strategies with which you could go. And we ended up going for very different strategies, which well, was a lot well, of fun. 
Well, I was going to say, you say it was neat and a big part of the game, but I don't know if I agree with you because I completely ignored it. <laughs> well, well, that was one of the strategies, though. Yeah, yeah. And if I remember correctly, the game ended up being relatively close, right? I think it was a one-point game. Was it? Uh, this wasn't the one that we tied and you won on a tiebreaker. I don't know. It was, it was it close. Was very, it was very close, and it was really neat to look at how differently we played. And we were just playing quickly because, you know, our friends were sitting there. But I think you could put a lot of thought like you would want with an abstract game. You could put a lot of thought into the tempo of that game because as you lay tiles, you're kind of generating your paths out from these four temple markers. And the, I don't know what they're called, the gardens or whatever, the, the connected tiles out from each temple could not touch each other. So yeah. once you got to the mid to late game, you started blocking off space on the board from where the other player could play to benefit their gardens or whatever. Um, one thing one thing I think that would happen on repeated plays would be that you could get real interactive, kind of passive-aggressive. I will say, though, that it was not my favorite abstract game I played at PAX East. There's another one later on I liked a little bit better, as much as we enjoyed Ishtar. Okay, yeah. An- another uh, one yeah. by by an equally famous designer is Bruno Catala, if not more famous. Are you going to keep this a secret until we get there? Yes, it's a, a building suspense, Matt. Uh, uh, building oh, okay. suspense. I'm sorry. I did. I... <laughs> An abstract game from one of the masters of our craft. It's not It's not brilliant. It's just, it's very nice. Ishtar just felt good to me. I think it looks nice on the table. The decisions were, weren't overwhelming. Like, I don't know, kind of bite-sized decisions, but every decision is really meaningful and, mm-hmm. and you're just kind of physically building something that looks nice. It's a little bit point salady, would you say? Um, ah, maybe that, that's not that's not the way to say it. There's a few ways to get uh, points, but it's very much just, in it's it's an abstract game, not in the chess way, but one in which you have right. short and long term point gathering. So uh, sure, it's we'll say it's an abstract Euro hybrid in that sense because yeah. it's not a yeah. battle game, but but it is certainly very passive aggressive. Yeah. I think if 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 you're into passive aggressive, this this is a game that you'll like. And who isn't really? I mean, <laughs> passive aggressiveness is might as well be the national pastime. I mean, isn't that like Great Britain or something? I don't know. Oh yeah, I guess that's their thing. I guess Americans are more straight up aggressive. Aggressive, aggressive okay. compared to Europeans. Is the stereotype actively aggressive? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we got a comment from one of our patrons, Mark, not me, but. I'm not. I don't have a multiple personalities, but there's actually another Mark, uh, and he says, "We promise." Uh, we promise. <laughs> says whenever I see a game that's 15th century farmer and has some drab aesthetic, I'm immediately turned off. Maybe a good game, but I can get an equally good game with better theme and art. Like I love Agricola too much to say that to agree with that. <laughs> okay. And I love the next game we played too much to agree with that. <laughs> There's a lot of great yeah. games with about okay, 15th but century here's farming. Thing. Here's the thing. Farming matches up really well mechanically with a lot of games. Oh, yeah. Like, it, it, there's a reason that it's the theming on so many games. Oh, yeah. It matches up with many good mechanisms. Indeed. Although there's some, as we've discussed before, there are some things going on in Agricola that I hope aren't, aren't accurate. You know? <laughs> weird uncle well uh, the next game that we play that you almost played but you had to take a phone call uh sadly because you would have loved this game uh, is Kalis 1303 this is this was the number one game that i've been wanting to play in terms of games that i feel like i ought to have played and this is the new version and i, and I understand there are some significant differences but I, I looked on bgg and the consensus seems to be that the new one Most people actually enjoy the new one better, and they say it's an improvement on it. So I'm fine not having played the original Kalos with the grumpy man on the box, although that box cover is hilarious. And uh, I'll be content having played 1303 because it was really, really good. It was a very fun game. You watched us kind of play the last couple turns, I think. And for those who don't know, Kalos is the game that essentially invented the worker placement genre or the mechanism, whatever you want to call it. It, w- and it, looked, it looked way more interesting than I expected, given that d- description. Oh, it's really good. 
and it is brutal and you can be really mean to players because it's a worker placement game where you're kind of building new spaces to place workers on as the game progresses. But there's this dude on a horse, the provost, and there are a couple spaces in a, in something that triggers automatically that lets you move the provost and the places, the places on the board only activate up to where he is. So you're, you want to progress the game and build these buildings because they give you points and better opportunities. But you also, if you push really aggressively, the other players can just kind of hang back and then collude to not give you any actions or, or significantly fewer so, actions. So, I, yeah, I watched the last third of the game. And some of the negotiations or, I don't know, pleading with each other... <laughs> To move the provost into like a, you know, a mutually beneficial area or something were looked really fun. Oh yeah, and it just reminds me, you know, as I've been playing, as I've been playing a c- couple new Reiner Knitz or not new but old, new to me Reiner Knitzia games, and trying to seek out a couple of these older classic heroes, I'm realizing how much nastier these Euro games are than many of their modern euro games and Kalos is a perfect example of that like if Kalos came out as an original game today i think a lot of people would complain that it's too brutal and too to take that I, I, th- I could see people saying take that and it kind of is but it's in such a way where there is negotiation and there is risk like actual really good risk assessment and being able to push the push your risk a bit but have backup plans in case you can't get the provost yeah. where you want it is really valuable and all of that is so interesting and like these Reiner Knizia games are so interesting because they're so interactive and I now understand the people who were like man Euro games aren't what they used to be I used to think oh come on there are a bunch of great Euro games and there are but they're just different a yeah. lot of the modern Euro games are so softened and uninteractive compared to the classic ones that have stuck around and and I I'm starting to really enjoy that that super interactive euro and and I was thinking about this literally as a shower thought in the shower the other day and actually on Twitter earlier today that maybe it's time to split the genre up into different genres to indicate for instance what we would call euro games I think can be divided into three different categories And be fairly accurate in terms of creating neat categories that a lot of games can fit into. You could have, and I've seen this distinction, I've read this before on BoardGameGeek, a distinction between German-style family games, so like Catan, Carcassonne, King Domino, really light family, Spiel des Jahres type games that are not super luck dependent and they're not, uh, they don't have player elimination. Classic what you were brought into the hobby as a Euro game. I think you got to have a second category of, we were joking, the Baroque Euro, or I think that was the name that was going around Twitter today. That's the kind of multiplayer solitaire, maybe point salad, but but I almost want to call it a mechanical Euro. It's about the complex puzzle gears of the game and navigating that group of interlocking mechanisms. So it's more of a puzzle. Yeah, does that specifically de-emphasize interaction? Yeah, and then there can be some, but like the Vital Lacerda games or yeah. Cooper Island is a perfect example, One we're, a game we're going to talk about later. It's very much about solving the puzzle of the game, and there's some incidental interaction, some very passive blocking, that kind of stuff. And then I think you could categorize a third category of like the interactive economic game. You could pull in some stock games in there, but stuff like Container or maybe Power Grid, Kalis, these can, it's, like Stevenson's Rocket could fit there with a German style game, but these games that are very, have a lot of interaction and economic calculation, but the core of the game is developed by the player's actions and you right. trying to navigate what the other players are going to do rather than navigating all the different incentives from the game mechanisms. In those kinds of games, the, the mechanisms of the game were a platform for a lot of interesting, complex stuff the players will be doing and the implications of that. Whereas a game like Cooper Island is 
navigating the complex structure of the game itself with very incidental intrusions by the other player. And I think that might be a valuable way to to split what we would call Euro games is into something more meaningful. Yeah. Um, Anyways, Kalos is super interactive and I love it. (laughs) (laughs) All that to say, yeah, I like that. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that I, I have a neat response to the, to the whole of what you're saying, but I, yeah, like Kalos feels so different than, yeah. When I think of Euro, I still think of Catan just because it's what, like you said, brought me in. In in those two games, hardly have any right to be in the same category. Yeah, and, and there's yeah. so many Euro games or Euro inspired games that, you know, it's a very, very broad category by this point. It's not this like unique little underdog thing that's fighting the American big shots. Like really the the true American style games are pretty much all but I mean, there's they're a minority now in terms of just the number of games and at least the popularity within our hobby all right and the next one we played is point salad a point salad game about salads and salads bring you points uh i built the greatest salad can't see the air quotes around salad yeah Um, i built the greatest salad i think i tweeted it it was for most of that game i had entirely bell peppers (laughs) right? (laughs) and i don't like bell peppers very much personally but i was enjoying that salad it got me many points well they're the bitter green ones i mean if it were like red bell peppers maybe well they were yellow in the game so yellow's Uh, all right the darker the bell pepper in red uh, the better it is green bell peppers should never exist it, for some reason before the game, I started talking about uh, the Permani sandwich from Pittsburgh, which just has like coleslaw on it, which is like cabbage and a little bit of carrot. And then that's exactly what I did. I just got all the cabbage and all the yeah, carrots. That's right. You made a coleslaw. Yeah, this I, was... And, and I was... So, <laughs> how? what is this game? It's really simple. They're just two-sided cards. On one side, there's a vegetable. On, on the other side, it scores points based on the the contents of your salad and i'll just say up front that i was speculating on carrots i never did draw or or draft a carrot scoring card for all the carrots that i had yeah i mean it was a fun diversion we were it was late in the evening we were a bit loopy and that was the perfect time to play that game because it's just kind of grab cards. You can't plan ahead. Everything moves too fast. You just kind of see. Yeah. It's one of those like parlor games, like a trick taking game where you, you want to like be having conversations while you're playing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, we were we were basically having a loopy conversation about salad the whole time. Yeah. So if you ever want to uh, talk about salads, that there's said, the I, perfect. I quite enjoyed it. I, I would play that again in similar situations. You know, it. Yeah. I'd play it again. I can see why it's it's been well loved. Um, uh, it's not super exciting. I will say it's not my favorite card based filler game where you want to play late in the evening that we played at PAX. Okay, all right. Well, you um, you you know the other one. So look at the list. It's coming oh, up. My. That's oh yeah. Not fair, Mark. That's it's not fair. it's not really a fair comparison. But anyway, Who knows po- what the game is. Look at us building the suspense. We have so many layers of suspense going. But it was enjoyable. <laughs> the presentation is super clean look nice, and you can make a salad entirely out of yellow bell peppers, which is, of course, everyone's favorite salad. But speaking of clean art... Oh, boy. Electropolis. Only, I think it's Korean? Korean or Japanese? Or Taiwanese? I feel Um, bad. I think it was Taiwanese. Okay, yeah. It's what Rand said. It's not available in the U.S. right now. You can, he said you can order it from Asia... And it's not too expensive, but it's not being distributed in the U.S. right now. And it is a really nifty, clean-looking drafting game. I'd say drafting is the primary aspect of it. And it's got a cool little mechanism where you are trying to fill up a grid, uh, a personal player grid, and there's a number of tiles out to draft. And you select how many cards, how many of those tiles, rather, you're going to take on that turn. But the more tiles you want to take, the later you get to choose them, and you have to get tiles that are adjacent to each other. You can't pick and choose. You have to take one, yeah. one clean line of them, yeah. um, which was a, be... a nice little puzzle, risk-reward kind of thing going on there. And there can be real penalties to being stuck uh, with one or two 
of the of, of a type of tile that you don't want. Yeah, so you're trying to build like an electrical grid power source thing, and there's what three, four different kinds of power generators. There's nuclear, gas, coal, and green Which renewable. Has yeah. Three different kinds. And though the green ones don't require any other things, you just play them, you get some points. The other ones have varying amounts of prerequisites in terms of fuel, and then they cause pollution. And you're trying to balance pollution with was it public support, I believe it was yes. called, yes. which is another yeah. factor in it. it. That was delightful. Yeah, because I, if you're if your pollution at the end of the game is significantly above or even a little bit above your public support, it's what you you get deducted points by the square of the difference. So yep. even if you're even if you're three off, you're losing nine points, which is a fairly big chunk. The winner was in the eighties, I think. Yeah, th- thematic wise, I just love the idea of like you just have the most enthusiastic citizens that just absolutely adore you, and then it's it's just like thick smog everywhere. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the cool thing is there's also a, a decision between you have these like smog or pollution reduction yeah. centers that want yeah. to be next to power stations, but to score better for your power stations, you want them to be next to each other. So I went for reducing pollution, but I ended up like with public support, like 12 ahead of pollution, which was pretty inefficient because I could have gotten more points from my power stations if I just yeah. not put the pollution reduction. And then it, you... it remains suspenseful to the end mm-hmm. because that is such a balance. And it's a it's a real cost to arranging your city in a way that minimizes pollution and maximizes support. It's a real cost. So you don't want to get too out and ahead on one or the other because that last round then just becomes so critical. You have to get what you need or or really suffer in the points. Yeah, it's just a really finely designed game. Um, I think it's it has this almost perfect balance between strategic and tactical decisions because you could start yeah. out with a particular strategy and then have to pivot based on the circumstances or find little gains that you wouldn't have found otherwise. You get this there's another card you get after you take your your tiles that can change point scoring mechanisms. That that part was incredibly fascinating. So well, it also dictates where on your grid you can put the tile. So yeah, sometimes it, it, you could take a lower point scoring card, but have to take it because that's the only one that lets you place the tile where you want to place it. Yeah. And I, I think there was some real depth in that that I didn't realize the first time playing through. Because if you notice, at the beginning of the game, those tile, those scoring tiles, I guess we'll call them, that come out, have end of game goals. So in the first couple rounds, you're kind of deciding what you want your city to look like. Mm -hmm. And then in the mid game, the tile placement becomes a little more flexible. Those those scoring tiles give you a little more options of where you can place things. And they mostly score immediate points based on what your city looks like now. And then I forget at the end, there were there were some some powerful ones that came out that were maybe a little more limited. I just found that super fascinating. And and again, that really plays into the decision of how late in in the draft order you're willing to go that round. Yeah. Because you might look up and you might really need to place the piece in the upper left-hand corner, but there's only one draft tile that lets you place up there. So anyway, my hot take is this was my game of packs. I, Ooh. Uh, yeah, I was just blown away. First of all, the production. We, we were talking about this. It has, I don't know if, it, if it's just foreign producers in general. I think it's uh, Asian. Asian have, have just this delightful palette that, it, I don't know, how would you describe it? Well, the color palette's nice, but it's just so minimalist and but, but minimalist, yeah. clean. I, I, it's so clean looking. Yeah. It's uncluttered. Um, yeah, and I associate that style with the color palette because they do come come together usually. But yeah, it's just it's a it's a like a white base rather than browns or saturated colors everywhere. Yeah, uh, it's pastels. It just looks incredibly good. It yeah. takes up exactly as much space as you want it to and no more. It plays quickly. 
It plays quickly, and it, it, and honestly, uh, I just thought the drafting of tiles was phenomenal. And there's just something about tile placement, city building games that that really delights me. So anyway, that's my hot take. Uh, I think the next game we're going to talk about is probably the better game, but Electropolis is the one that I am most excited to play again. I mean, Electropolis, there's four games I play that are kind of my top tier that I think are very, very good, okay. and Electropolis is in there. Yeah, and, and yeah. Electropolis and Kalos are in there, and the one we're about to get into right now, Pax Transhumanity. Pax? Yeah, we played Pax at Pax. Oh, and I didn't tell you, Matt, but we actually played it slightly incorrectly. We played it, you know how it was taking forever to finish? Yeah. It's because the 30-whatever cards in the deck were supposed to also contribute to the initial setup. So we played like 30% more cards than we should have. Okay. That's why it took much longer than well, it should have. I so I can blame that on why I lost because <laughs> no, Matt, Matt, because you, you, guys you wouldn't with, have won anyways. You guys won with the city strategy that was only possible because the game dragged on. Yes, but Matt, you had you had no prospects. <laughs> so you had very little. Game. This is not a game that you win on first play. <laughs> this is not oh no, this is not a game you understand <laughs> on first play. So it's the second of the PAX games we played. We've also played PAX Premier Second Edition, which we played last year at PAX East. And I think this is an absolutely fascinating game. It has these internal loops that you're trying to navigate towards, and they're all way too expensive. And it's just grinding to try to do things. But once you kind of figure out those loops of being able to research into something, be able to commercialize it, and then gain from that commercialization and really just control the way the game progresses is such an interesting puzzle. So yeah. the key of the game is that it can it has what nine different ways it can end or seven different ways it can end based on if you build your fifth company which is what I did you win the game immediately. Based on where the research has gone, you could end in the singularity if like one particular type of research just gets pushed over and over and over again back to back. It'll trigger the singularity and then that will cause ultimate chaos and then you only score based on your hidden research focus. Or it can finish with one of four different other research focuses or, or parts of the world being emphasized and then you score based on how well you've done in that part of the world. So not only are you trying to do things that are productive, but you're trying to shift the whole meta tone of the game towards yeah. the end result that you will benefit from. Because you certainly can't, it'd be pretty impossible to be ahead in every single win condition. Like the game would be conceded yeah. by point that by that point so you could do yeah. it be very successful in like the developing world but if you can't sway the game to finish emphasizing the develop the developing world all those points are not going to score for you they'll score it'll, uh, another part of the world will score or of space and figuring out how to actually accomplish things in this game is such an obtuse in a good way an obtuse puzzle highly interactive you can really screw like almost pretty much anything you can do will not you cannot do within the two actions of your turn so you're yeah. always signposting what you want to try to accomplish and other players can take their turns to stop you from accomplishing that thing if they think it's significant enough so so much by, depth by the end of our play i had caught on to the game enough to kind of see what was going on. And I was the only person of the three of us that this was their first play. But by the end, I kind of, I saw enough to recognize, oh, Mark's going to win next round. Um, <laughs> and I'm very proud of that because it took a lot of mind-numbing thought to get to the point where I could recognize that the end of the game was coming. But so I spent my last couple turns just like screwing you over and then, and then the same with Rand just because you guys were going to end the, end the game on the next turn. Yeah. Um, and it is such a deeply thematic game, and I love the theme. I love yeah, this futuristic, yeah. Before we... kind of near-future, semi-plausible, hard science-y stuff. It's so good. Yeah, I almost want to put this into the, you know, it is sci-fi, but it's kind of in the same category that we were talking over earlier about um, parts in that... Uh, 
it does feel it, it did feel pretty unique it just kind of thinking of the in the totality of humanity is kind of the theme mm-hmm. uh, so it's not like sci-fi in the sense that you're building warships and doing space things it's it's sci-fi in the more hard sci-fi sense of what is humanity in a future of uh you know technology and, and yeah it's about the development of technology i, I think i've I explained it to you initially as competitive research. Yeah, very much. Which that. very much is that. And um, every little detail is is thematic. Like the idea that yeah. you develop technology and you commercialize technology and it gives you patents in that sector of technology, uh, which helps you develop other technology in that sector. The idea of if there are nuclear conflicts that it, it blows away a certain, all the advantages that you had and problems you had solved like hunger in the, in certain parts of the world, the idea of like ending on a singularity and then it's every man for himself or one sector becoming super dominant if that's cloud or an AI or space or the first world. And then that being the only thing that matters, like it's, it's complicated, but for entirely thematic reasons. Yep. Yep. Totally. And and you can tell that just, there was a lot of love poured into the thematic elements. The, The flavor text on each card is done so well. It's like these very succinct descriptions of the impact of these incredible advancements in humanity. I, f- I forget who the designer is. It's the son of the the other PAX game. It's, right? it's Matt Matt Eklund. Yeah, I don't know if uh, he did the, the the theme work, but it's it's obvious that he's a a lover of sci-fi. Um, mm-hmm. Really fun to read all those bits. Yeah. Um, spoiler uh, yeah. spoiler alert for the future though. This at this point, this is probably my 2019 game of the year. Yeah, and I, I totally totally see why that is. So after one play, I can't even imagine kind of the macro game of steering the end game to a certain ending. Like I, I'm gonna have to play it three or four more times before I think that that really becomes a big part of how I play the game. Yeah. And, and like you said, when you first start the game, it's just a struggle to get anything done, but in the best kind of puzzly way. So, yeah, my impression was just like the depth of on so many different levels, this game kind of boggles the mind. Uh, it is really sweet, pu- really sweet puzzles all over the place. I haven't felt that mentally worn out playing a new game since playing PAX Premier. Yeah, the PAX games, at least based on these two, really force your mind to think in ways that are different than any other game I've played. Before we get to our next game, let's talk a bit about our sponsor. Thanks again to them, Endgrow Games. They've funded their Kickstarter, and it is ending in only a couple of days, so check it out in the link below. The next stretch goal I checked just before we recorded this, and it is very close to being accomplished, and it is a custom double Helix DNA wooden piece, which looks pretty rad. Uh, Again, this is two games, Reach, which simulates 3D space in a cooperative game, and Okazaki, which has players trying to build DNA strands uh, either solo or together. Each one is only 18 cards. Click below before the Kickstarter ends. Now let's go on to our next game, which is Deep Blue, the new Days of Wonder game. And Days of Wonder games are always something uh, worth checking out. But this is one I was fairly disappointed in. So Deep Blue is this sea exploration diving game where you're going around a area of ocean and you're trying to dive for treasure. It's got a deck building thing going on. I think the game wanted us to do more deck building than we did, but I didn't see a huge advantage from it, but I also lost by a significant amount. So maybe maybe we I did not play particularly well, but it's a deck builder that's also a bag builder as you're adding more and better artifacts and stuff to the bag when you go dive and you're like drawing these gem pieces out of the bag one at a time and seeing if if a certain amount of hazards pop up before gems do or before you cancel uh, and retreat um, and grab your your gems, uh, then you lose a lot of it. My big problem is that 
I think the core of my frustration to the game is that the map itself, the geographical movement and everything, didn't add much to the game at all. And this is a problem I have with Interesting. a good number of games where I think more times, especially on the games I play like at Boston Fig Fest where they're like prototypes and brand new designers and such, is that I find myself thinking a lot, why does this need a map? Yeah. And I think it's a pitfall a lot of people fall into is that they want a board, they want a map. But like Through so, the Ages showed us we don't need one. The, that's a brilliant game and it has no map and it took away the map on a super map heavy genre. So why aren't other people just trying to find ways to eliminate the map? So I I, I had left PAX by the time you guys played this. How much does this remind you of Clank? That's what I see looking at the, the board. It's... Clank is like a proper deck builder where you're trying to build up something that synergizes. This okay. one is like, do you spend a turn getting a card that gives you a better card? Like the cards in the deck building thing are, it's it's more of a tempo. You're not getting cards like every turn or have the possibility of getting, well, I don't know. It, it's in appearance a deck builder and in like every mechanical aspect, but doesn't feel like one. Yeah. Okay. I suppose you could take a strategy where you do buy cards a lot. And you'd like miss out on some dives, but your dives you do go on would probably be more lucrative. I don't know. It just all felt a little, everything kind of felt like half baked compared to its potential. And I think, I think a large part of that is that there's so much time spent and turns spent wasted, just moving these ships around. And it's only a move that just sets up the fun parts of the game. It's not in and of itself, the fun part of the game. Yeah. I'm still waiting for a decently length deck builder that, that has a, a you know a map element. Um, I think I think it could be really cool, which is probably why we get games like this. You have a map. There's, I, there's Mage Knight. I, I was gonna say I <laughs> I can't bring myself to say it, but the best ones already been made. <laughs> I did say decently length, so Mage Knight is the perfect length for what it is with two players <laughs> it, it, or one player. <laughs> Yeah, but seriously, like, but I mean, Clank is probably Mage the best Knight we've has got. Deep deck building, and it has a a map that leads to hard decisions, important decisions. I I didn't get that from Clank. I'm more down on Clank than a lot of people are. Clank anyway, in space is a bit of an improvement, and I've heard the Legacy Clank is actually quite good. That sounds excellent. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, might if think, I didn't have about, a lot of games to play. Yeah, thinking about games that could be improved with Legacy. Clank up there. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, play Clank instead. It, this is an improvement over Clank. Although the idea of a deck builder that combines with a bag builder is maybe interesting, or maybe it's too much, like, you know, it's good to keep those random elements separate, but I don't know, it could work in a push your luck kind of way in a lighter game. That's the thing. Like, this is a really light game, and it just tries to have a production that makes it bigger and, and do more stuff than it needs to do. It could be a really quick 20 minute game and said said it's a 45 to 60 minute game. Speaking of games I don't like, I thought this was going to be the first one that you you adore, Mark. I don't adore it. I don't dislike it. So, our friends Brad and Steph who visited are huge fans of the Arkham games. Arkham Horror, Eldritch Horror. They said they said they really like Elder Sign. I don't think they played the card game. Uh, which is the one that everyone seems to like the best. But there's a new one, apparently, called Ar- Arkham Horror Final Hour, which is trying to do the Arkham slash Eldritch Horror thing, but in actually an hour. And it actually it succeeds at that. It was not bad, Matt. I'm here to say that. Not bad. I mean, I'd play Forbidden Desert above it in a heartbeat, and it does remind one of Forbidden Desert, but it wasn't a bad time. I actually enjoyed some parts of it. The cool part is that it's got the Gloomhaven thing where you're playing cards that have an initiative number on them and you can't communicate. And this one just forbids all communication. And depending on where you pop up in the initiative order, you play either the top or bottom half of the card. So really, yeah, it took it from Gloomhaven, but it's a great it's a great mechanism. I don't hold it against them. But instead of where Gloomhaven you choose, this one is literally based on the turn order. And the top half is generally damage mitigation. Uh, So in terms of like killing enemies and rapid movement, the bottom half is like investigation, the thing that actually helps you progress the game and and go toward your win con, but it also typically has a negative effect. So you don't have a choice of which card to play. You only have a choice based on a hand of tiles of what initiative number you're going to play. 
Like you literally draw the top card off your deck. That's the card. And it's just a matter of where you go in turn order and which half of the card you're playing. And then otherwise, it's a basic run around the map. Make sure enemies don't build up too much in a particular location. Bad stuff happens. Clock ticking. Try to investigate all the stuff. And yeah, the the basic, the same thing that we've had since pandemic of mitigating the problem while yeah. also racing toward a solution as two kind of binary separate goals that work a bit against each other. Uh, but the whole initiative thing in the card play was, was fairly interesting. I still think the art and look of this series is just boring just absolutely boring and puts me to sleep and i don't understand the appeal of these dim dark it's almost like everything's out of focus like there's no distinctness to anything it just doesn't capture the lovecraftian horror that i mean that's what well and and one could argue that it's literally impossible to do that in a board game maybe in an rpg but it's just oh it just looks so ugly it's so ugly like on a technical level, the art is fine, but it's just like so, it's just so busy and there's these little tiny chits with monsters on them and they just look like blobs. They're all blobs. And like that, I was saying during setup, this looks like a blob, that looks like a blob. And then I th- one of them was like, well, that one literally is a blob. I'm like, okay, point taken. Uh, <laughs> but they just all look like amorphous blobs and, and, and it's all dark. And yeah, you want to, be dark but if everything's dark then it's not scary yeah like it's it, this is basic principles like if you see the monster right away it's not going to be scary you need suspense if everything is tense nothing is tense like you can only turn that ratchet so far and board games are just really bad at doing it but but it wasn't a bad game it was <laughs> I, a didn't bad, dis- so, so it, I didn't dislike it than a lot of the, like the arkham we played in college that was probably well, a longer uh, game than this uh, well, this was this was straight up like forty five minutes to an hour. Arkham Horror. I mean, the one time I played in college was like four or five hours, and yeah. then we like lost unceremoniously, and we're like, "Oh yeah, we we're about halfway through." So, yeah, I mean, I don't really remember that game. I remember Eldritch Horror better, which is supposed to be the better version, and I I enjoyed this more. If only that it was just snappier, and you felt like you had actual decisions. There was more decision making that felt good here than in Eldritch. Yeah. So this is, I looked at it, it doesn't have a very good BGG rating. So this is probably all blasphemy to people who like the series. But, and I promise everyone, I still have the LCG on my shelf. I actually took it out of its shrink wrap and punched the chits. And then I haven't yet played it. I promise I will be playing this game because everyone says that's the best one. Like, even people who also hate the Arkham series. I will be playing it. So far, Final Hour is my favorite of the three that I have played. Next, we get to my fourth of my top tier four list, Cooper Island. This one I wasn't really paying attention to until I saw that Paul Grogan said it was his favorite game of 2019, or at least was at the time. I don't know if he ever published a official list. In Cooper Island, man, we were talking about these like mechanical Euros where the real puzzle is the game. I don't know if I've ever seen a game where that is true as much as Cooper Island. This game kicked my butt. And I was wow. doing my, like, nor- in most games, you can kind of, like, half commit to a plan of action that seems reasonable, and you can end up with a reasonable score. I started doing that, and halfway through, I realized I was doing a bunch of things, like, halfway, and that going halfway literally gets you no points. <laughs> And then I had to quickly figure out how to get some points, and I think I ended up with 10. And so, uh, Mark ended up with, uh, the other Mark who we talked about earlier, ended up with like 23 or 24 or something. So this looks kind of cool on the table. Um, it's got it's busy. It certainly it, looks busy. It's a standard worker placement thing, it's got but it's just hexes. literally a game of interacting mechanisms. Oh, yeah, the hexes. Yeah, you're building up this terrain. The cool thing is every time you build terrain, you put a resource cube on that terrain, and the power of that cube or the number of resources on that cube is equal to the stack size. Okay. And then if you take it off the terrain, so as a free action, you can take it off the terrain and put it in your supply, but as soon as you do that, it becomes only one value. So you can create mm. these like three or four value resources, but then you can't put anything on top of those until you use the resource. So, oh man, it's just about this very, very intricate, multi-layered How interactive is it? it, Um, Does each player have their own kind of island? Yes. 
Okay. And it's interactive in that your scoring is based on you you keep score by moving the boats that go around the edge of the game space, the middle space. And if you hop over and you can build these like inlets or islets, I can't remember what they call them. Uh, they stick out into the water that have various things. And whenever you hop over one of those with your boat, one of yours or someone else's, uh, you get to do that thing. There's also a couple, there's a couple bits of interaction. Oh, if you go in a worker space that someone else has already gone on, you have to give them a tax, which is like a resource or a money. So there's a little bit of interaction, but it's very much, it's very much a multiplayer solitaire style. You super, yeah super crunchy euro like i i think i tweeted right after the band it's like a puzzle on a half it is so much there and then it actually punishes you for not being good enough which is nice okay. it's not like you're getting like a few points less there's there's not a there's not a very high point floor is what i'm saying like if you don't plan ahead like i didn't i was just kind of going along doing things that seem neat uh you will not score <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is nice. It's got a bit of teeth to it. But uh, if you don't like that kind of game, you're certainly not going to like it. But I do like that kind of game. Maybe I wish there was a bit more interactivity. But again, I don't love the, in these new categories, I don't love the interactive economic game necessarily more than the mechanical Euro. I just think they're two different goals. They're two different aims. And uh, I think Kalis and Cooper Island are perfect examples of each category. So how long is this? It, it, I mean, it looks like there's a lot going on. And, and related question, you said it's like solitaire, multiplayer solitaire. You're not taking turns simultaneously, I assume. That there's some sense. stuff you're doing simultaneously, but no, it's worker placement. You place one worker at a time, do the action on the space. In terms of gameplay, I don't know, a bit over an hour for two players. It took us probably a solid 20 to 30 minutes to learn the rules. Okay. The rule book, by the way, I don't know if Grogan, Paul Grogan did the rule book, but it was very nicely done. Reading through it really got a good understanding of everything, and it, and it was in a very good logical order. I could see it 30 to 45 minutes. I'd say if once you know the game, probably 30 minutes per player kind of game. That's Because you only have two workers, and you can get yeah. up to four, but man, you got to be really focusing on that to get up to four. We got up to three for like the last of five phases. So it's like we took... What would be that? That'd be eight, 11 turns each, 11 actions each. There's some free actions and such in an income phase where you get to play something. But yeah, it's it's not a lot of decisions. They're just monumentally important all around. So very, very nice game. Cooper Island, I look forward, if, I, if possible, to playing that one some more. Going back to one of the games we teased a bit. This is the other abstract game I played uh, at PAX East. Nova Luna from Uwe Rosenberg and someone else whose name I had not heard before. Sorry, co-designer, for neglecting to mention you. Uh, you're Van not as Morsel. Who is it? Cornet Van Morsel. Yes, there you go. Maybe one day you will be as famous as Uwe Rosenberg. That was so this, mean. <laughs> this is a game that I, I recognize. I have seen this box on many tables at many conventions. What? I, I, I believe it's like, brand new. Is it brand new? I think, I think it's 2019. I think it's 2019, yeah. Maybe it's just the last couple, but... um. Yeah, so it's just, a, again, drafting tile lane, and there are two elements that matter. There's Well, there's three elements. There's the color of the tile. There are the little pips, which are like missions you're trying to fulfill, of different colors. And then there's the number on the tile, which is the cost in turn action spaces it takes to take that tile so you're literally just drafting one of the first three tiles available to you placing it onto your space in front of you the number it's it's tokaido style so every whoever's furthest back goes next you're trying to lay tiles so for instance if there's like a yellow blue red pip on like in one circle of one of those tiles you will score that if there's a yellow, blue, red tile adjacent to that tile, if there are okay. multiples of the same color in any one mission, that has to form a tr like a line, a train. So it can't be if there's like two blues in a pip, it's not two blue tiles adjacent to that one. It's one blue tile adjacent to that one and then another one ad attached, another one that's non adjacent but attached to the one that's adjacent to you. If that makes sense. Okay. So, and then it looks like you're placing circles 
on on top of those little missions yeah so once you accomplish them you place a circle on it and it's literally just a race to place all those circles Okay. So it's a really neat little spatial thing where you're trying to figure out because every tile both creates new missions for you to accomplish. I don't know what they're actually called in the game terms, but they're little objectives, but also contributes or potentially contributes to accomplishing one or usually more other objectives. So you have to think about it both directions at once. And then nice. you have to factor in the tempo loss if you're going to take, like, a 7-1. You may miss a turn and a half. Like, really simple, basic concept, but really fun. That sounds great. Another one, not really one you want to chat around because you're going to be sitting there staring and thinking about what you need, but a really mind-bendy twist to it that I, I enjoyed. Me. Speaking of mind-bending, we played Cosmic Frog. I saw this on Twitter. Oh, have I not explained the premise of the game to you yet? No, no, I okay. only know about this through your, like, two tweets. Okay, Cosmic Frog is a game where each player plays a two-mile-high, interdimensional, frog-like being, where you're battling over trying to literally eat remnants of the shard of the reality you're on, and then disengorge those elements into your cosmic vault. Other players can run up and punch you in the belly so hard that you... D- disengorge the things into their mouths. <laughs> I'm not sure that disengorge is a disengorge word is I the word used use. is the word used in the rules. Disgorge. So, oh Amber's so correcting I, me. It's disgorge. Disgorge. Yeah, okay. disengorge would be a bit it's gilding the lily of that word. But yeah. So I, I looked this up on Board Game Geek to see what the game looks like. Well it's still prototype there, form. Okay, okay, because I was going to say that there's just, like, 20 beautiful images of cosmic frogs. and Oh, yeah, no... the art they've got is great. <laughs> okay. The rest of it was just, like, block wooden blocks and some admittedly pretty cool-looking frog minis. But anyways, what I just explained to you is the most fun part of the game. Hearing oh, okay. about the game is... It's, it's the hearing about the game part. Playing the game is... Yeah, it's not great. Like... I, I saw a tweet from someone who said that Cosmic Frog is like, it's like the game that you, you invented in your basement when you're eight years old and then given some polish. Okay. And it kind of is. Like, there's some there's some stuff that's clever and well done in terms of like the more land you eat, the slower your movement is. And there's this little resource. Oh, yeah, there's a resource called Oomph. Mm-hmm is a side resource that lets you like move further distances or take a second action on your turn. It's literally called oomph. But ultimately, it's just the same like run around a hexagonal map and punch people game. Like just because the game says that you're punching a frog in the stomach and they're vomiting up pieces of reality into your mouth doesn't mean that the part of the game in which you do that and you just roll dice against each other is fun. Yeah. Like, maybe you can ham it up and make it fun, but the fact is you're just rolling two D6s that are slightly modified against each other. And it's like, it's we, we've got better ways to do that kind of thing. And I understand that it wants to be random and chaotic, and I like some games that are random and chaotic, but so much it's just like, I'm, I'm referring to Twitter a lot, but I've issued a lot of these thoughts on Twitter. The unit of your turn should at be, at a minimum, something that's fun to do. And I think a lot of unenjoyment I get that's hard to, out of games, that's hard for me to put words to is because there are a lot of turns where I'm doing something that's just not fun. In other words, I'm just setting up to do something fun. Hmm. Interesting. And maybe it doesn't bother me as much in other games as it does in some other games, but a lot of Cosmic Frog is literally I move two spaces and then pick up this cube. And again, you can say like, oh, I'm engorging myself with this mountain or whatever, but like... You just moved your frog two spaces and picked up a cube or a hexagon or whatever it is. The disconnect between the theme and then your actions in the game is so wide. It's just moving spaces on a grid, rolling some dice, and you have admit you have these action cards that are like special abilities that will rotate throughout the game, and you can keep them hidden until you reveal them for your special ability, like Cosmic Encounter. Sure, that's fine, but... The game came around to a lot of running around picking up hexagons 
And then, like many, many, many combat games, multiplayer combat games, and this is a, a big hurdle to overcome, when you engage in combat, it usually just helps the people who didn't engage in combat. And that's hard. It's a yeah. hard thing to overcome, and this game doesn't overcome it. But So I admire the audacity of the Mickey game. The theme is hilarious and fun, and I love telling people about it, but the play experience was just so underwhelming. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to read more about the the nature of this universe but um yeah maybe we'll get some spin-off games with other frogs i i want to explore more cosmic frogs just not this game (laughs) and mark in the chat says cosmic frog come for the setting then leave for a better game that's that's about right and then Um, now we get to a better game a better game The, the other game we teased before i hope your suspense sustained itself over the last 40 minutes (laughs) we played goat and goat again our game of packs goat. unplugged. We played it with other people, and, and a couple of them really liked it, like we did. Another one was like, "Yeah, it was a fine filler game, but I don't see what's special." I don't know what's so special about it either, but I just have a blast. <laughs> like the main tension's cool, of like the numbers you want to lower numbers are more flexible, but they draw you fewer cards. That's super great. I don't know. Is it goats? Do, do I just really like goats now? Is that what it is? Has the game seduced me with pictures of goat faces? I mean, in the what three months four months since i first played this game i haven't like gone out and found other games that feature goats so i don't think it's just the goats are you saying goats aren't going to be the new wildlife game theme fad um i you know it's a possibility but i don't see the evidence yet i mean goats eat everything in their path right that's just a game right there i yeah i was thinking about goat about eating when we were talking about point salad actually um, <laughs> But, Point salad, the goat game. I mean, no, we uh, we should build that, Matt. I'm going to add that to my list. <laughs> the goats eat the salad, and I don't know. But yeah, we played it three times in a row. It's it's still great fun, and apparently we one of the people we played it with, our, our friends from Pittsburgh, they found and bought a copy from Japan, and they said it was only like 17 bucks. So you can, even though it's not distributed yet in the U.S., you can get it. Finally, the last game I played on Sunday when I was alone. Everyone had deserted me, so I went to the Unpub section, and I played a game that I actually had played the year before, not in the Unpub section. It was literally like cards and sleeves, super... It was like I was wandering around alone, and then there was these people at a table, and they're like, hey, want to play a game? And I was like, uh, sure. And it was their prototype for this game called Boba Boss. <laughs> they weren't that creepy, don't worry. Mark was wandering around and found his game dealer. The <laughs> they were table. dealing a game... And then I played it, and I it had some interesting ideas. And then I went to Unpub, and I sat down at the table that was empty, because I was like, I'll just play a random Unpub game, give some nice feedback as best I can, and hopefully it's not too bad. And then I looked at the guy who was demoing it, and he looked at me, and he's like, have we met before? And I'm like, maybe? <laughs> have we? You look kind of familiar. And then he said, like, well, let's just play the game. Maybe I've played it before, but I don't recognize it now. They changed all the graphic design and art and stuff and added a few more elements. But as soon as you got to one part of explaining the game, I'm like, oh, yes, I have played this. We played this last year. Long story short, Boba Boss is a real-time game. Frantic takes like a minute to play a single round, although you can, you can, there's a, the rules to like have continuous play where your decks change and such. And it's just a silly, frantic, real-time game that you can make really, really silly, which is fun. The core conceit is that you're trying to flip, it's based on Boba, the bubble tea, and you're trying to flip all your tiles over. And so you're literally just drawing card one at a time from your deck, and some of them are like flip a tile over. And so you flip it over. Some of them are flip two over. Those are really nice. But other ones will have colors on them. And there are three elements to the color on the tile. So there's the background color, which will be one color. There's a word written out of a color, so it'll say red. And then there's the color of the font of that word, which will be a third different color. Okay. And so the simplest way to play the game is you just pick one of those elements, and that's what the color of that card is. And you flip over someone else's card, you get to flip back one of their T tiles. But the the element, and when I played it, it's okay. It gets pretty easy after a while to just ignore the other two elements of the card. But he added this time, which I think makes it a complete game that's worth trying to sell. He's trying to find publishers. We talked about different strategies there. So if you're a publisher who wants to, to uh, publish a real-time game, here's one that I think is pretty good. 
the element that really makes the game is that you shuffle in three cards that have that highlight those three elements of color. And at some point, someone's going to flip over one of those. They put it in the middle of the table and they shout out what it is. And then you have to shift which color element you're playing with on the fly. Yeah. And that'll change X number of times per game. And that's a real brain twister that you can't just kind of get through. It really takes some concentration. Otherwise, you're just flipping over tiles and it's a mad rush of hands flying all over the place and cards going everywhere and flying. And then if you want, there are these other tiles that have all kinds of physical things to do. So maybe one card, you play it against another, like attack cards. You play it against another person, they have to spin around in a circle three times. Or you like can't bend your elbows or all kinds of zaniness like that if you want to make it really crazy. And you can mix those in as you like. But I think just the base game is, as a real-time crazy party game, it was it was fun. I enjoyed it. I played it a few times. Nice. What are you doing with the colors exactly? Like, do you have to match adjacent? Oh, so when or... you flip over a color, it'll match someone else's color. And then you flip back one of their cups. Gotcha. Okay. To the empty side. It's a That's not super different from, like, the Spot It thing. You played that? I've not played that. I, I'm sure there are other games that have a similar element, but I think the, cause it's hard to read a word, but then think of a different word like that tricky brain thing that introduced in the game. I don't think I've ever seen before. So yeah, fun game. I mean, it's not my favorite real time game. I, I told him about space alert. Um, he had, he had not played space alert. So I'm like, yeah, if you like real time games, that's the one. But I think, you know, he's been looking for a publisher for quite a while, and he's, we talked about he's had a lot of rejections. And I think this is, there's certainly worse games getting published, I'll tell you that much. This was, this was fun. We laughed. We laughed. We, we didn't cry, but we, we laughed again. Anyways, that's what I played at PAX. I also want to highlight that I uh, taught our friends from Pittsburgh, both through the ages and Concordia, which is a delightful thing to do that I haven't done in a while, which is teaching someone a game that I adore. And then watching them fall in love with it as they play is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I love it. And I did it twice. Nice. Still two of the best games ever made. It even inspired me to go download the Through the Ages app, which I've been playing now before I go to sleep. Nice. It's very good. Is that multiplayer? I think I own the app, but I don't think I've ever played it. Yeah, you can play online against each other. But is the AI good? Oh yeah, the AI is challenging. It beat me on easy the first time. I have not yet beat it on hard. I beat it on easy and medium now. There are a bunch of different challenges that'll change up different aspects of the game against the AI and such. All right, I think that's our PAX cast. Yeah, so you, um, I don't know, are, are we playing fewer games at PAX? Or do I just have, like, a false memory of playing... Well, you're only there a third of the time. No, 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 I mean, in general. Like, I'm looking at this list that, that you you played. You played, I don't know, I guess four, three or four games a day. Fourteen games and two magic events? That's pretty good. I don't think that's... That's it's too shabby. Cool. Plus some, a couple of random demos yeah. going around the hall. I might have read a rule book, but didn't play the game at one point. Maybe not. No, I think oh. it was pretty. Well, we played a couple of games multiple times. The Point Salad we played multiple times, and Goat and Goat we played multiple times. Boba Boss. Yeah. Oh, some of the shorter games. We um, we started, you taught me Pax Transhumanity, and by the time we got done learning the game, I decided that I had to have food or else I would I just fall asleep. So yeah, the whole Pax Transhumanity process took like four hours because we that learned took a long time. I had to it kind was... of refresh my memory, teach you the game. We then ate lunch, came back, added a third person, and then played accidentally thirty percent too long. Yeah, um, <laughs> well worth it, but that that was a, a significant part of my Pax experience. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Orion and Lindsay have Spirit Island set up right now, so I'm going to end this podcast and play another one of the greatest games ever made. That's that's excellent. I'm going to play one of the greatest games ever made, Magic Arena. Magic Arena. (laughs) Watching one of the greatest games ever played, the Pittsburgh Penguins. Oh, thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever else you get podcasts. You can find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you would like to support this podcast and comment on our live streams of recording the podcast and support everything else we do, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. We are only a little ways away from our next, I don't know if they're called stretch. I think they're just called regular just goals where I will do a weekly vlog for 
all of the patrons outlining what I've played that week and some early thoughts on games that you can get before I actually publish reviews. So I would actually, I think that'd be super fun to do. So I'm hoping we hit that goal relatively soon. Again, that's patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Later. Later.